This program contains sensitive content, which some may find disturbing and inappropriate for younger audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. There are more than 4 million children sex trafficked in the world today. What does that look like? What can we as Christians do about it? What kinds of interventions can we offer to change the lives of these victims and give them a sense of value and hope? These and many other questions will be addressed by our guest today. Stay tuned to meet her and hear her story. My name is Yvonne Shelton and you're watching Urban Report. and welcome to Urban Report. My guest today is Cherie Peters, host of 3ABN and Dare to Dreams program, Celebrating Life in Recovery, and the CEO of True Step Ministries. She's here with me today, and she has a special mission in mind. Welcome to Urban Report, Thank Cherie. you, it's so nice to be back. Oh man, you know, you have to know that I just love you. I love you. From the time I watched you, I first watched you, before I even met you, I watched you on Celebrating Life and Recovery. And I thought, she is just so real and just, you just, and you have a relationship with the Lord and it's so obvious. And so I'm like, oh, she is just great. And then I had the chance to meet you and to know you. And like, I just, I just love you. So Thank I need you. to tell you publicly right now, I just love you. Well, I receive it all. <laughs> I receive it all. And when we talk about, like you, when you mentioned there are 4 million kids worldwide being trafficked, is that you, you know that my background is I was homeless for 10 years in Los Angeles. And so I ended up on the streets at 13. And within 24 hours of a homeless kid or a kid that is going to be pulled in that um, industry within 24 hours, it happens. So it's it's amazing to me how many kids, runaways, foster kids, um, uh, children that are struggling anyway, then all of a sudden get pulled into an industry that they can't get out of. And when they get pulled in, the shame of that keeps them down. Um, definitely the, the pimps or the people that are running them keeps them down. And so to me, what I learned early on in my life is when I met Christ, I never felt shamed. I never felt condemned. Condemned. I never felt like he he looked at me as one of those and everyone else as, as some, something else. I just felt loved. And so to me that as I start to work with kids in different countries and in different areas that are being trafficked, I know that I have some good news for them. Yes, it, because yeah. you've been there. Mm -hmm. That See, that is so, they would accept it so much better from you than someone like me who's not been there, who doesn't, he can't, I can't speak the language, so to speak, right. because I haven't had that experience. Other experiences I've had, that one I haven't, so, but you have had it, and so you know what it's like. Before we get into what it's like for them, how did you end up getting trafficked? How did you end up being homeless and getting trafficked? Well, just like for a lot of kids, I was raised in a very dysfunctional home, had a lot of trauma, um, was molested since I was three months old. I don't know what it feels like not to be used. Um, I, you know, like I see people with their fathers and even mothers, and I don't know what that feels like. I don't know what it feels like to be loved and to be cherished or taken care of. And so by the time I was any age at all, I had been molested by my dad for most of my life. He, um, when my mom kicked him out when I was four, he would pick us up every once a year for visitation, take us to a warehouse, molest us and bring us home. So I, I had no concept of um, how not to be used by men. Um, people like me or like um, damaged kids are really susceptible to anybody that shows them attention because we're starved. I mean, literally I was starved. Um, and, and so somebody gives you attention, you automatically um, trust, um, they give you a couple trinkets, you know, and I'm talking trinkets, and you think that, of course, this must be my boyfriend, or this must be whatever, and so you really are susceptible, and it sounds ridiculous to say it, but it's so, um, you're just susceptible, yeah. and you really are screaming out as much as you can, I just want to be loved, I just want to mm -hmm. be safe, I just want to belong, and the more you get pulled into an industry that being safe, you're anything but safe, um, and so you, you learn how to 
play, you learn how to manipulate, you learn how to be safe. Like, um, I know that when somebody said, when I ended up on the streets at 13 for t the next 10 years, and when someone says, um, you know, from day to day, what was that like? I didn't think from day to day. I thought, mm -hmm. am I going to survive today? Mm -hmm. What is going to happen today? So I didn't think about where, you know, usually somebody would pick you up and you would have a place to stay until they were done use, using you or until you were done being used. And so I, I moved around about every three months. And, um, you know, when I looked at the stats, when I got into recovery and I looked at the stats, in Los Angeles alone, there were 80,000 kids like me. So, you know, somebody says, why don't we see them? Because they're picked up pretty quick and they're funneled into industries. And we're talking child pornography, we're talking um, film, we're talking prostitution, we're talking dance clubs. We're, you know, they're used in so many different ways. And um, the only time you will see them again is if they're strung out or crazy. And, um, you know, I might have been both, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you'll see them again when they, they are not able to use them in the same way. And so um, luckily when I turned 23, I was just done. I was really done and I was trying to kill myself. And I, I had an encounter with God that surprised me because I'm in a drug house, I'm looking for ways to kill myself. And there, I didn't have enough drugs and I was just gonna inject air into my veins until my heart exploded. I, and I don't even think that could work, but I was that desperate. I don't wanna see another day. And somebody had put a gun to my face and they were gonna blow my head off, a drug deal had gone bad. And I remember just thinking, thank you so much. Like I was so done that I couldn't, I had a lot of failed suicide attempts. And when he was gonna blow my head off, I just felt joy. I just felt thank you and didn't realize that he was just trying to scare me and so I had to take a breath and do the next step and so meeting God and not feeling I was condemned by everyone people would see me as as a kid because I looked really trashy I mean we look you see kids on the street that you know that they're they're either prostitutes or they're druggies or whatever mm. and we make judgments and um, and when I looked out at the world all I saw was judgment and at that point when I met God, all I saw was love. <laughs> oh, now when, growing up, was there any talk of God in your home at all, ever? No, I, when I was really, I, I made a suicide attempt at eight and I ended up with an injury. I jumped off a house. Mm. <laughs> Before I jumped off the house, I put a mattress down. <laughs> so so, I, so I'm you not weren't good at quite it. trying to kill yourself, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Well, at eight, I was trying to kill myself, but I didn't want it to hurt. So okay, I was really okay. Oh, that. bless your heart. So because I was injured, um, and I was taking a lot of time away from the family because mm -hmm. I had to go to Children's Hospital. They found out that I had this disease, and, and I had to go three times a week for physical therapy, that my mom ended up sending me to Canada to an aunt's house. And that aunt was 70 years old, but she was, you know, Christian, really loving and sweet and um, but I went there um, angry like you can't this is kidnapping you can't just keep me and so she tried a lot of different things she tried to pray with me um, I came in <laughs> you would laugh at this Yvonne I came in and there was a, a cross with this dead guy hanging on it mm -hmm. and I thought who is that I mean you know who has a dead guy hanging on a cross in your living room. And you had no idea that it was Jesus? I had no idea. Wow. So she said, um, that's God. And I thought, oh, great. Because, <laughs> mm. you know, the only thing is, what good is he going to do me dead? Do you know what I mean? And so there was no sense wow. of any questions after that. There was no sense of anything other than she tried for the whole year I stayed with her to pray with me. She tried to take me to church. And I was angry. Like, I thought because my parents were druggies and they were really lost. Um, but I thought if you keep me, they will forget me. And my whole growing up was trying to get someone to love me. My mom's boyfriend, my mom, um, I had sisters and brothers, you know, and that, you know, trying to get that attention and that love. And so she eventually sent me back home. But that was the only Christian I had met. And, and when she was dying, I had already met Christ. So when she was dying, um, I, I said, I, you know, I want to go back and just tell her I'm so sorry. Like, yeah. I'm just sorry. And she said to me, is from the time you left my house, I prayed for you every day, right? Wow. And I said, um, and she said, when my mom, my mom was raised by her because her mom was alcoholic, my mom's mom. 
And she said, when your mom left, I prayed for her every day. So I've been praying for your family. Now I'm looking at her and she's dying. And I said to her, you know, and I just was crying. I like, who's going to pray for us now? You cannot mm. go now. Mm. And she said, it looks like you are. Oh, wow. So it's like this, this kind of baton that was passed. Yes. Is that um, we need to pray for each other. There's always, I believe, somebody praying praying for us. And if you know somebody that's not being prayed for, take up that mantle and pray for them. That's beautiful yeah. advice. Beautiful. Yeah. So you, from your experience, you decided to help children yourself who have been, and, and you're going all around the world yeah. finding these children. And tell us about, about that, about your journey with these children who are trafficked. Well, the, my first experience of children that were trafficked is I was asked to go to Thailand to work in Thailand. And um, I was, for one, I was amazed because I always try to do a little bit of research and that kind of thing. And so I knew that it was a highly trafficked area and there was a lot of kids. And, and uh, but I didn't, I didn't expect to be on the plane and listening to people um, talk about how to reach these kids. Like if you want kids that are young, this is the area that you're going to go into. This is the price range that you're going to offer. This is, and so they were kind of educating these people. Are these, you mean these are pedophiles on the yeah. plane? Pedophiles on the plane. Oh, That man. have gotten a sex tour from a major company. So people take sex tours into these areas and these tours are like any other tour that you would take. Like I, yeah, I went to Israel and I took a tour. Right. So these sex tours are from Germany, from the U.S., from different countries that come into these um, areas that have um, high levels of kids being trafficked. Um, but I was I was so shocked that, you know, I'm listening to this dialogue on the plane. So when I get there, I start working, first of all, in the red light district right out of Bangkok. And then we start going into some smaller and smaller communities with younger and younger kids. And the youngest kid I held was two. Right. I was I stayed in a hotel with um, the, the pedophiles because I wanted to be right there in that area when we started working with the kids. And I opened up the I, I pushed the elevator to go up to my room and the elevator door opens and there was this guy having sex with this young boy. And I remember the girl that I was with had been viciously raped. She was in her teens and she just fell back and was um, unconsolable. So we literally had to process through that. But it was like no, no matter where you looked, it was not hidden um, 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 trafficking. It was obvious trafficking. And so um, the, the, the experience I had was that, is anybody doing anything? It was my first thing. Is anybody doing anything? What are we doing? Because these kids are, even though they look like trampy kids mm -hmm. <laughs> to someone, um, I wrote a book called Miracle from the Street. Mm -hmm. the I read it. Title, it's really good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The first title of that was God Even Loves Trampy Kids, mm. right? And I know that God sees every one of those children, right? And so my, my thing was to try to find um, sponsors, to f try to find education for them, to try to find safe houses. And so we did all of that where we're in Bangkok. And, um, and that kind of got me thinking that I can't, just forget where I came from. I can't forget these kids. And yet, as soon as I came back home, I started to get different jobs. I've written like five different books. I've started working at 3A Band, and I've been blessed by every single encounter we had um, with you guys, with our teens, and with our adults. And then I start. I got hired at the General Conference and sort of started working with them. I started teaching leaders how to speak directly to these at-risk folks on the streets. And then after a while, I thought, you know what? I'm I'm so, I'm too removed. Like, um, you know, I, I feel like um, there's when somebody calls me, for one, there's no place to put them, and another is I'm getting more and more removed. And so I started to pay attention to what's available. Like in the United States, when you talked about those four million worldwide, in the United States, those 300 to 400 thousand kids a year are being trafficked, and that's just the kids they know of, right? Yeah. And with these trafficked kids, there's 1,000. 644 beds in the whole United States for these kids once they are brought into the system and put in for help, 
right? And none of the programs that these beds are long enough to actually make a difference in these children's lives. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I started to really think about that and sort of talking about that and, and just recently put together a program to where we're putting six homes on the ground mm -hmm. and each home has six to eight kids in. We'll do their full education. We'll catch them up academically. We'll um, have the therapists in there that are trauma certified to work on their trauma and will literally help them to unlearn everything they know because what we know is how to if you've ever heard a five-year-old talking to a John you will know that that child knows um, how to communicate in a way that they should never know. Right. And so being able to unlearn that and being able to get in their own skin and be able to just be a kid, it takes a while, sometimes up to 12, 15 months. Mm. And so our programs are uh, taken into consideration that these children, and they are victims. <laughs> you know, yes. People used to arrest them as if they were criminals. These are victims. They're victims. Um, when they say, um, with a child, um, a child can't give you consent you know, and they are being coerced. They are being, um, you know, uh, victimized and raped and abused. Sometimes repeatedly, repeatedly throughout the day, every, every day. single day, you know, every day. It's unbelievable. It's, I cannot wrap my mind around it because it's so brutal yeah. with children and it's wrecking them. I mean, emotionally, psychologically, it is doing such damage. And it's like, as Christians, yeah. We have to say, how are we reaching this group? Yeah. How are we bringing Jesus to this group yeah. of victimized right. children? Yeah, because we're not even thinking about um, the number of perpetrators involved. Right. 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 And so literally that there's that God wants to reach all of these yes. folks. Yes. Uh, so I had a nine year old come up to me and so I was doing an event and it was late. The event went late and then there was wonder ones and then there was all this stuff. So it was almost midnight and I'm thinking I got to get home and get some sleep. Not home, but back to the hotel. And someone says, there's a, a, a child that's waiting to speak with you. And I said, I'm like white noise, you know, and she's like, they said she's nine. And I thought, who let her stay here to speak with me, right? And so I said, okay, bring her in. And so she's a foster kid. She's um, going to a Christian school, an Adventist school. And she looks at me and she said, um, my mom's in prison for prostitution. And I said, oh, you know, and so now I'm wide awake. Right, right, right. <laughs> so I'm wide awake. And she said, um, my mom taught me how to take care of men. So when she goes to prison, I could go to foster care or wherever and, and play um, uh, with these men, these boys or these guys. And um, when she gets out, she'll come back and get me. And so she's already seduced a foster parent. She's already seduced one person from the school. And I'm looking at her like, is this a nightmare? Uh, you know, I'm hearing this kid so nonchalantly talking about how her mom taught her using, um, how her mom taught her how to do oral sex and how to do all kinds of stuff so that she can survive while she's in prison. So she's telling me all this. And, and finally, I, I'm praying to God, like, God, what do I say to this kid that already is just matter of factly saying stuff that uh, is, a, is the worst nightmare for some folks, right? And so she said, um, I'm really good at what I do, she tells me, a little nine-year-old. And I said, hmm, do you think I was good at what I did? Like when I was on the street, you heard me talk about my story. Do you think I was good? And she said, yes. And she smiles. And I said, do you think I'm good at what I'm doing now? And mm. she said, yes. And I said, you can choose. Mm. You can choose. It's up to you. You can end up prison, in prison like your mom. You could end up being used your whole life or you can let God turn everything around. And I watched this kid get it, and I thought, oh God, you are so good. Yes. You are so good because a minute before, she was bragging to me. Yes, yeah. yes. Just a minute before, she was, she was truly just in the flesh. Mm -hmm. But in that split second where, where you said, and how wise of you, praise the Lord, that the Lord, the Lord put that in your spirit to do that, how wise of you to give her that choice at that point yeah. in time. Do you want to keep on like this or do you want this other, a better life? Yeah. And, she, and she got it just like she that, huh? It, it was wow. so ridiculously cool. And so when she gets it, so with, with these children that I work with, is you can't try to force them to get it on your timetable. 
right? The moment will come up, the situation will come up. If they're in a program, like, if I, like as we're putting a program together, we have control of the program. And just like the, it's a monarch youth centers is what we call it. And so just like a caterpillar goes into the little um, chrysalis of the cocoon, yeah. they totally dissolve into like a liquid, right? Mm -hmm. So they totally, everything about them dissolves and then they are recreated into this butterfly. Like, how does God do that? I don't know, but that's exactly what happens to these children boys and girls, is they literally everything they know, for mine, my molest started at three months old on, so everything I know about not being loved, not fitting in, whatever, God has to take all of that and I have to relearn how to be in my own skin and relearn what, what does joy mean, what does love mean, what does it mean um, that I am safe. And, and all the studies show, which is incredible, is a brain will not heal unless it feels safe. Did you know that? I did not. The good brain health is amazing to me. I, it's probably my um, one of the things I love the most, but the brain won't heal and you can't fake it. You can't say I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe and just do um, an affirmation. Is a brain doesn't heal and, and you can watch it with the equipment and the scans that we have. You can watch it start to heal, but it doesn't heal until it feels safe. So once it feels safe, um, things start rewiring, things start um, setting themselves up, you start um, venturing out more, all of those kind of things, but you have to provide all of those Maslow's hierarchy of needs yes. first. They have to be safe, they have to have nutrition, they have to be able to trust their environment, all of that stuff, and all of that takes time. So when someone says, I would like to support a two-week program, the it's not even going to do any good, right, a two-week program? It's not going to do any good. And not saying don't do it. Mm -hmm. If that's all you have is two weeks, do it. But we have these kids for two years mm. plus. And so being able to give them vocational training, being able to give them education, catch them up. Some of these, like I was 23 and illiterate. Some of these kids don't even um, um, read. They have no um, academic history from the time that they were abducted or moved into this industry. And so we catch them up on all that kind of stuff. But most of all, what we do is teach them who God is and who yes. they are in Christ. Yes. Um, and so excited to do that. Uh, and we have some pictures of some of the homes that, that you have that, and you can explain them to us and how you know, what a day looks like for the children. So this is, you know, what is that? I wish we had more of a picture, but this is the, the back side of the youth um, home. And there's eight rooms, four, four bathrooms. It's on a number of acres. It has a fully functioning um, uh, ve vegetable um, greenhouse. And so the kids have their hand in the dirt and they're growing things. They're actually growing things and selling them. And their hands and, in the dirt, right? Yeah. yeah, and yeah. people don't realize how healing that is. Yes. Unbelievable. Yes. And I even talked with, because we're, we're getting the seed money to put these um, six houses on the ground. That's one of them. Our first one should be open by October. And so we're putting these houses on the ground, but, but I talked with hospice and I said, you know, I got to get these kids to actually reach out and do something in the community so that they're not having just people doing for them. Mm -hmm. There's something about blessing someone else that's yes. really healing. Yes. And so I said, hospice, would you let us take this organic food or these organic um, things that we're growing, put meals together and take it to people that are dying in the community. And they said, we would grant you monies to do that. So not only would these kids grow this food, but they would put meals together and literally take it to the dying and sit down and just sing with them or talk with them or share with them. And so teaching them that everything that you do has value. And so in the greenhouses, the kids actually get a stipend, get a pay. And by the time they leave our facility, they usually have about $10,000 um, that's theirs. So so they can get the apartment. You don't just put them back on the street exactly. to be victimized. Yes, yes, you know? yes. But that's amazing. Yeah. So, so we have a special offer today for yes. any of our Dare to Dream viewers and audience. That uh, any of you that are listening or watching, we have a special offer. This book is they called us baby. And for a donation of any size, and I'll have you tell about the book, yeah. for a donation of any size to True Step Ministries, 
you can get this book. Tell us real quick about this book, and then we have to put up your address roll. Yeah. This book is about a, a young girl that was arrested from the sex trade industry. She was um, um, uh, caught with a dog. So that the, the book is kind of from the dog's perspective what happened, and because it's really tough to have a young girl um, talk about her experience. And so um, she, was, she was taken in, put in foster placement. The dog was put in a, um, a placement for a humane society for, for animals. But the whole thing talks about when she was abducted, when she was sold, her, her view of the streets. And um, we wrote that book to educate people a little bit on what the sex trade industry is. But this kid in this book, so she's in my area, um, both her and the dog actually are in my area. And so when you, when you meet them, they, both of them are excited about being saved. They, they both, you know, even the dog gets better food. The girl is now in, in placement and it's being able to say that these are just kids. And even in the book, they call us baby, is about the whole story of who they are and the sex trafficking um, that happened with them and what happens on a day-to-day -day basis with this child that gets used, taken oh. in cars or in hotels or whatever, is that she's used to the whole thing. And on the back of this, it has questions in this particular book, depending on who you're working with, whether it's a high school group that is working on um, how, how do people get trafficked, mm. um, you know, and most of it is online now. You can buy and sell kids on Craigslist. Mm. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So it just talks about all of those areas that you're most vulnerable. Wow. Well, well I want to put your address up because I want people to be able to contact you to support this. This is such an important ministry. Uh, it's True Step Ministries, P.O. Box 163, Kuna, Idaho, 83634. You can email truestepoffice at gmail.com. Go to the website to donate, truestepcelebratinglife.org, or call 208-562-8477. That's 208-562-8477. That's how they can reach you. Do not call 3ABN for the, for the special <laughs> offer. Our call center is not handling this, but True Step Ministries is going to give you this book and there's a whole information kit about drugs as well that just tell us real quick about that and then we'll close. So we just have a whole thing about drugs, any kind of drug that, that you want interested in learning about and how to get off of them, how to help a loved one. And so if you want any of that, um, that also comes with that packet. Yes. But we really need seed money right now. So any amount, yes. any amount that you can um, provide for us, um, for these kids, they and are so worth it. They are so worth it. And you know, when Jesus was here, he said he came to set the captives free. And that's what we're trying to do with these programs and, and what you're doing, we have to set the captives free. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. I can't believe our time is up. Join us next time because you know what? It just would absolutely not be the same without you.